and verse 3, John chapter 18 and verse 3, continuing the series on contextual exegesis, tonight's topic, they went backward and fell to the ground. Let me read the verse of interest. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Now you have to picture this is at night. Nobody is clearly being seen, and there are lanterns, and there are no pictures. And so whether these men were, how familiar they would have been to the appearance of Jesus, that's a little bit um, understandable that they wouldn't exactly know. Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon, as soon then as he said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. I'm going to call to your attention just this last phrase. They went backward and fell to the ground. Now there's a false teaching. The false teaching is, based on this verse, that a band of men and officers went backward and fell to the ground under the power of God. Let me read it again. I want you to think about it as I read it. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon as he said unto them, I am he, they went backward and they fell to the ground. Now, did the band of men and officers step backward and fall to the ground under the power of God? Or did they step backward and fall to the ground out of awe and respect for the one that they came to arrest? Those are two different outlooks at this particular passage. Now the incomplete context. By incomplete context, I mean what do we what questions can we ask about this verse? All right, first question. Why did the band and officers step backward? Okay, Jesus is here. It seems that they approach towards him. And then when he says, I am he, they step away from him. Now you would have expected that immediately they would have went towards him as far as arresting him. That's what a policeman would do today. And a second question. Why did the band and the officers fall onto the ground? Now let's look at the immediate context. We'll see what led up to this in chapter 18. Chapter 18 and verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, the brook Kidron flowed between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. It wasn't a very big brook. It certainly was something that you could walk through and go across without any uh, form of a bridge or anything like that. Where there was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now we get to the same passage that we've been looking at. 
Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. So he's not shying away from identifying himself at all here. He's admitting to who he is. He's doing that in a forthright manner before these men. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. We find in the other Gospels, in one case at least, that he came up and kissed him as a form of greeting, and that was agreed upon to identify the one who was Jesus of Nazareth. And as soon then, as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and they fell to the ground. Then asked he uh, them again, then asked he, he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. His disciples are with him at this particular junction. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. So he's thinking about here a form of protection for his disciples that are with him. Verse 10, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and he smote the high priest's servant, and he cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. Now this is the only altercation that happens here. One man comes forward, and Peter goes to defend Jesus, and he is not very good with the sword, maybe the man ducks like this, and in case the ear is sliced off. Um, we find elsewhere that Jesus miraculously restores this ear to this servant named Malchus. Verse 11, then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So Jesus here is perfectly ready to be arrested. There is no real defense put up except by Peter, and the altercation involves only one man, this man Melchus. Now verse 12. Then the band and the captains and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, no resistance here, and led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now, Annas himself had been the high priest. He was the father of several high priests as far as his sons, and this is his son-in-law, Caiaphas. Verse 14, now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known to the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. Now we find elsewhere that this is identified as the disciple that Jesus loved. And if you compare several things in the book of John, you will realize that this is John Mark. Okay, and that John Mark is actually the son of Simon Peter. I will not prove that tonight. Continuing on here in verse 16. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. So there's kind of a general area where Jesus is being interviewed. And in this outer area, uh, there's the ability for people to come and go, and this lady is able to open the gate or the door, and Peter is able to go in. Even though he's not right close in with what's happening, he is able to see it and view what's going on. Then the damsel that kept the door, uh, then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art thou not also one of this man's disciples? And now we're entering into the phase where, where Peter denies knowing Jesus. 
And he said, I am not. And the servants and the officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. And Jesus answered, I spake openly to the world I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. So they had the opportunity to know exactly what Jesus taught. They had the opportunity to meet the men that traveled with Jesus. They had the opportunity to say, to see if there was any secret things or any secret movement that Jesus was about. Now verse 21, why askest thou me? Ask them what heard me. What have I said unto them? Behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So there must be some amount of distance between these two men. Uh, whether we're talking about just the distance of this room, there is some amount of distance, but it doesn't seem like Peter gets up and moves substantially. So it seems like the location is still the same. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, unto him, Art thou also one of his disciples? He denied it, and he said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? So the identification comes a little closer. Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. And so we have Peter denying three times, very definitely, that he even knows Jesus. He just happens to be there. And the rooster crows. This is happening in the middle of the night. It is definitely near morning when this occurs. And it's an embarrassment because Jesus foretold that this would occur. Now let's look at the accounts that are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. See what we can gain here. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 47. While he yet spake, lo, Judas... One of the twelve came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. Here's the identification that Judas has agreed to give. And forthwith he came to Jesus, and he said, Hail, Master, and he kissed him. This would be a normal greeting. You'll see sometimes this in France. Uh, when they pin a medal on somebody, they will kiss the, the man on each cheek, you know, and uh, to show honor and respect, that type of thing. Verse 50. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Jesus' response is to greet Judas with the word friend. Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them that were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, and he struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father and presently, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions? Legion would be a thousand, legions of angels. But now then shall the scripture be fulfilled that it thus must Thus it must be. 
And in that same hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. See how this figures in when we kind of do a flashback and we look at an instance where Jesus could have been taken before. Verse 56, But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. We see this was universal. Peter was not the only one to flee. They all fled. They all moved aside. And Jesus went with those that came to arrest him. Now, Mark's passage is just a bit shorter and includes some of the same details, but I'll read it for uh, completeness. Mark chapter 14 and verse 43. And immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I will kiss, that is the same, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and said, Master, Master, and he kissed him. So outwardly, there's respect being shown for Jesus here by Judas. But obviously there's treachery in that he is pointing out to everybody who Jesus is, who they came to arrest. They laid their hands on him and they took him and one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out against a thief with swords and staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not. But scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. Now Luke's account. Luke adds in a few details here. When you, when you consider something in the Gospels, most Bibles have a little reference above the paragraph that's inserted by editors that tell you, where you can look to find a comparable passage in one of the other Gospels. It's important in your study to read all of those passages and see what's added in um, in the various accounts. Now Luke 22, 47. While he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? And when they were, which were about him, saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far, He touched his ear, and he healed him. So this is a detail given by Luke. And Jesus, uh, then Jesus said to the chief priests and the captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Come ye out against a thief with swords and staves when I was daily with you in the temple. He stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. You see, he's pointing out something here that could have taken him at any time. He actually went to the temple from the beginning of the week and every day went into the temple and taught. He was in the outskirts of the temple, thoroughly available to anybody that wanted to come to him. And they were afraid to come to him because of the multitude that were there to hear Jesus. And now they come. And when do they come? In the hour of darkness, in the middle of the night, trying to eliminate any resistance. Now, we've looked at all of these accounts. 
you notice one thing. Jesus is ready to be arrested. He does not allow his disciples to fight. He offers no resistance. He identifies himself when they say they're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. So there isn't even the shred of an idea of any resistance by Jesus in any fashion. And that's important because that tells us something about whatever it means for them to move backward and to fall down on their face. It's not as a result of Jesus trying to not be arrested. He's there. He has decided that he is willing to be arrested and he knows that this is what's going to happen. Now let's look at the extended context here. In extended context, we consider something else throughout the book of John that might help us to understand this passage. And there's a real fine account of something that happens about six months before. It's in the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's found in chapter 7, beginning in verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Talks about Jesus' glorification. It's always speaking of his resurrection. Now verse 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. There's a reaction that's coming about people in the crowd, people listening to various things that Jesus has been teaching throughout this week, and now it's the last day of this Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 41, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? So there's a dissension here. Verse 42. Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So they look at this. They remember this. And of course Jesus had been born in Bethlehem. They're trying to figure this out. Bethlehem, of course, is not in the region called Galilee. So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees and said unto them, uh, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? So in this particular instance, there were men sent out to take him. And they wouldn't put their hands on him, even though they were sent to do that. And when they returned, they were questioned, why did you not bring him? Verse 46, the officers answered, never man spake like this man. They were impressed. They were in awe of what Jesus had to say. They weren't willing to take him, to arrest him, to bring him in. They recognized that many of the people were saying, this is the Christ, this is the prophet. That was their response. Now verse uh, 47, then answered the Pharisees, Aren't you, are you uh, also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Now this is kind of a cutting question. But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. 
inferred here is, is that nobody believes on him except for the common rabble, the people who really don't know anything. But that's not the case. There is one here, and it seems like it's the one that's over the entire group who speaks up. The man called Nicodemus, Nico means to conquer, and Demas refers to an assembly. You would have the idea that he is the moderator of the assembly. There was at the time what they called the Nasi, and the Nasi was the one that would have been over the Sanhedrin. Now, they always governed by a consensus, and usually the younger members of the Sanhedrin would speak first, and then it would filter up to the older ones, and they would form a consensus. That's the way they were supposed to operate. But Nicodemus here is putting himself forward. There was already the question, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Is there anybody that has any stature has believed on him? Does anybody who knows anything believe on him? Nicodemus says this. Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hears him, and knows what he doeth? That's a good question. He wants to go by the law. He wants to go by due process. He wants to look at the precedents to bring a man like this in. What has the man done? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also from Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. And so they also put down the leader of the assembly. This is the type of thing that was going on. Okay, we see here very perfectly that those sent out to bring him in refused. Because they stood in awe of this one. They knew he must be the prophet, if not even the Christ. They saw and heard what he said. They saw the reaction of the people that thought carefully about who Jesus was. You see, it would have made no sense for anyone to recognize a false Christ. Okay? Because then they would be in the position of supporting somebody who was a heretic. So they would be very methodical. They would have to see Jesus and watch Jesus and see his miracles and hear his teaching and know that his teaching lined up with the Old Testament scriptures. To come to the place where they say, I believe this one is the Christ. Now that's the way we should all operate when you look at the Bible, whether, it's, whether I'm the person teaching or somebody teaching on TV or some other church that you happen to be visiting. You need to compare the scripture with what someone is saying. If they're not lined up with the scripture, then you reject them. And if continually they're not lined up with the scripture, then I would say you're in the wrong place. Anybody can be off on a particular passage, on occasion if it's a minor passage, but they're not going to be continually off. They're not going to be off on the main things. And so what we see here is a prime example. Now if I carry this back to what we saw at the very beginning, you have these men, they're approaching Jesus, and once they realize who Jesus is, they back up. Then they fall down. Those two acts were the normal acts that you would do before anybody of authority. You would do that on your own. The first act of backing up would show that you haven't come to threaten the one that you're appearing before. So if you come to the king, for instance, and you come upon him suddenly, 
oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not here to do you any harm, and you back up. That's the same way you would act with anybody that you approached if you saw that somehow you were approaching somebody and they took you as a threat. The moment you can see that somebody has that comprehension of you, you step back. You've, you basically have stepped into their personal space, you know, and you, you don't violate somebody's personal space. Now, I'm, I have a personal space that's bigger than other people's personal space. I mean, I don't want anybody closer to me. Than, if I could reach out and touch them, you're, you're too close. You're just too close. And you'll see, I'll, I'll back away from you in most cases. Some people are very close talkers. They want to get right up about this far from your face, and they want to talk to you. I, that, that doesn't work too well for me, so I back up. So the normal thing for somebody is to back up if they sense they are threatening somebody. If you want to show that you have a certain amount of awe or reverence or fear of somebody, then you take a second step. You back up so you're no more a threat. And then you might bow. A woman might curtsy. Uh, in their particular culture, they would go right down on their face on the ground. You're in a place of submission. I'm sure you've seen uh, old movies. Uh, maybe there's an English king. and Somebody comes to approach the king. Now, they don't just run up to the king. They come in, they slowly come up to the throne. When they get up, they take a step back. They go into a kneeling position. They are such that the king can reach out with his uh, diadem. It looks like a club, and I'm sure he could use it as a club or a sword. And he puts it on the guy's shoulder to show that the guy can rise up and can advance and make his request known. Now, on what we've seen so far, what we can say is, is that it would be very likely to say that these officers and the band with them moved back in awe and they fell down before Jesus because they considered who he was. Some of them may have even been part of the band that was sent out six months before. There's no indication that Jesus had to do anything to keep them from advancing. That there is in any fashion a power of God displayed here to keep these men away from Jesus. God wanted to keep them away from Jesus, if the Father wanted to do that, Jesus said he could have sent 12,000 angels and prevented that arrest. But there was not the desire to do that. Now let's begin to look at the whole context. We're just going to look at a couple examples tonight. The message is going to be reasonably short, and then we're going to continue it in part two. There are many examples that we can find of people that acted in this same way. Let's take a first one here. This is concerning the birth of Jesus. Now this is in um, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. It's a passage that you would clearly know quite well. But it illustrates this. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. The word worship means to fall down before somebody. Now, we don't use it that way today, but that is the way the Greek word would mean what it would mean. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of all the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah. 
For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east. Now this is an event in the sky. It word is for star can mean any event in the sky. It doesn't have to be just particularly the stars. Uh, they would have also called the planets stars. Any event connected with the moon or the sun would be also referenced in this, that particular way which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over the, where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they were come into the house, and notice what these men do. They saw the young child with Mary his mother, and they fell down. And they worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed unto their own country another way. So we see the wise men coming to Jesus. He's a young child, and they fall down before him, and they worship him. It's very similar to what's going on with this band that appears in the garden to do the arrest. In connection with your job, most of us have done things that we would rather not do. We have a choice in our country. We can quit our jobs if we're asked to do something that we'd rather not do. When it comes to a situation in the scripture, in, this, in the Bible times, or what we would say, the, the time of Christ, uh, many people were bound as servants. In the case of officers, in the case of, of these other men, whether they were connected to the Jewish government or whether they were connected to the Roman government, they didn't have a lot of choice in doing their duties. It's not a matter of they're going to lose their job. They may lose their life. And so they could find it very disagreeable, and they could be very hesitant in doing what they were told to do. They could try to weasel out of it slightly, as we saw in the instance six months before Jesus' arrest. But ultimately, they couldn't go against authority that was over them without suffering a great deal themselves. Now let's look at a second instance. Here we have James, John, and Peter. And this is on the mountain where they saw Jesus transfigured. It's actually a vision of the future day of the resurrection is what's going on here when Jesus comes into his kingdom. This is chapter uh, 16, the book of Matthew, beginning in verse 28. Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste death till they have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So we know the subject, we know the time, the Son of Man, the kingdom. After six days, Jesus taketh apart Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them into a high mountain apart. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, tents, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. And while he yet spoke, 
Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Notice the reaction here. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and they were sore afraid. It was a matter of awe, a matter of respect before Jesus and before this voice that they heard from the cloud. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So this is a second example of those that would fall before Jesus. Now let's look at uh, a third example, and then we'll be done for tonight. We'll take up part two in the future. Here we have some unclean spirits. These would be men that had some form of mental uh, difficulty, mental illness, and they were plagued by it. And yet they had a certain amount of sense that the other people did not have. This is Mark chapter 3 and verse 6. The Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they may destroy him. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon today would be in Lebanon. A great multitude, when they had heard, what great things he did came unto him. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. Now he would get, of course, into the ship and be able to move away from them. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, they fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And straightway, and he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Now, who recognizes him? The people here that have mental difficulties. They're not challenged by all the talk against Jesus. They can see very simply what Jesus has done. He has healed people. What did the Bible tell them in the Old Testament? When Jesus was come, the blind would see. The deaf would hear. The lame would walk. And these ones that had difficulties in their mind. They know enough to know who's before them. It's the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And so they fall down before him, worshiping him. Now we'll take up these examples in another time in part two. But what I want you to see so far is it's a normal thing to step away from somebody so you're not showing any threat, to fall down before them to show that you have respect for them. That was what was going on the night of Jesus' arrest six months before and had often happened in the case of people when they met Jesus and recognized who he was. And with that, we will stop tonight. Father, we're thankful for your word. I pray you'd help your people to see the point of all of this, at least when I finish. 